Good morning. Good morning. Open your Bibles with me to Ezekiel chapter 37. <coughs> in the bulletin, or in the outline, it says it's Psalms 37 today, but um, that was incorrect. I was, I don't know what I was doing, but it's Ezekiel. Um, Ezekiel chapter 37. Today, um, so th- there's one more message in the, in the Y series, um, and then that'll be next week. Uh, today and next week, I guess, it'll be two times a day. And then in three weeks, Sundays, two weeks, three Sundays, we're starting a brand new series called Giant Killers. They'll take us up to Easter. So I want to encourage you to be good inviters. And um, we're going to talk about killing giants in our lives and those sort of things. And uh, we're obviously going to start, we're going to launch from the story of David and Goliath and kind of use that each week. But it's not really about the story of David and Goliath as much about the story of the giants that we face and how we're going to overcome those ourselves. So... Um, all right, so today, today's message is going to be a little different. We've, what we've been looking at the last several weeks in our Y series is we, we use this thing called life map. On the front side of the outline, you can see the life map, and there's also a thing called simple five there. The life map is these essential commitments, things we believe are essential commitments that a person has to make to be a mature follower of Christ, okay? Not just to be a Christian or to be growing in Christ, but to have arrived at some level of maturity that, that these are all the commitments you have to make. So there's commit to attending, uh, there's commit to connecting, there's commit to uh, serving, commit to growing, and commit to coaching. Those kind of things are all a part of the process. Uh, and we talked about those over those period of weeks. Um, today, it, it's like what I'm going to talk about today is not so much in the life map or in the Simple Five graphic, but it's really the thing that holds it all together. The reason that we do what we do is what we're going to talk about today. And that is why declare hope? Why declare hope? I'm going to use a passage of scripture. You've been in church a lot of times. Maybe you may have heard this passage used. Um, it's got historical uh, significance to it. It's got all kinds of biblical theology a part of and those kind of things. I want to use it as a backdrop. This passage I'm going to read to you. I'm going to use it as a backdrop of why we do what we do, how we think, um, the reason that we, um, we, we talk the way we do and we do church the way we do. Ezekiel chapter 37, I'll read through the, the verses and then we'll get jumped in the outline. Verse 1. The hand of the Lord was upon me and brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of a valley. It was full of bones. So the prophet Ezekiel, um, and if you read the book of Ezekiel, he start, there's, there's lots of stuff in there, but the, the children of Israel have been in exile and there was a whole bunch of things in there. And he, um, and he had prophesied bad things earlier, and he's going to prophesy some good things here in a second. And, you know, it, I think about this a lot. It's like that phrase, set me in the valley. He, he has a, he's a vision. He's not really there, but he's in a vision of this happening. And he's, he's seeing this take place. And he's going to ask him a question, and the answer should be no. He didn't give him a no answer, but the answer should have been no. And what I want to come back to in a few minutes is, is that uh, I believe that we, live in a valley of dry bones. Anyway, it goes on, verse two. He led me back and forth among them. I saw a great many bones in the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. He asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Of course, the answer should be no. But what Ezekiel said was, well, sovereign Lord, you alone know. Then, I, then he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, Dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says about these bones. I will make breath enter you. You will not, or you will come alive. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover you with skin. I will put breath in you and will come, and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am Lord. Now, if you, I mean, I don't, I don't have time to get into all the history of this, but throughout Ezekiel, and even in this one passage two or three times, that concept then, in my Bible, every time it's circled. I mean, if you looked at my Bible right now, you'd see the word then circled. That, that phrase, then, you will know that I am Lord. That God has this thing that he wants to do, and the reason he does those things is because people will recognize who he is. That's, the, that's always the reason. Then you will know I am Lord. Verse 7. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together, bone to bone. I looked, and the tendons and the flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, so there was, but there was no breath in them. And then he said to me, prophesy to the breath, 
prophesy, son of man, say unto it, this is what the sovereign Lord says, come breath from the four winds, breathe in these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me and breath entered them. They came alive and stood up to their feet, a vast army. Then he said to me, son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are cut off. Therefore, prophesy and say unto them, this is what the sovereign Lord says. My people, I'm going to open up your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back from the land of Israel. And here it is two times in a row again, in my Bible again circled. Then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open up your graves and I bring you up from them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and you will settle and I will settle you in the land of your own. Then you will know that I am Lord that have spoken and that I have done this, declares the Lord. <clears throat> in your outline, number one, we live in a spiritually dry place. We live in a spiritually dry place. <clears throat> um, it's much less dry than what it used to be. It's a lot less dark than what it used to be. Um, when I moved here, and I tell these stories sometimes because it's important we remember where we've come from. Um, when I first moved here, I remember, I mean, minor things we'd talk about, little things. People just didn't have any faith to believe that God could do whatever he was talking about. And I used to say, I, it, 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 I said it kind of as a joke, I'm being humorous, but I wasn't joking at all. If you just got outside the boundaries of Macoupin County, you might be surprised at all the things God does. Like, it's shocking what God does. And it's like people just had such little faith and there was such, such little hope and, I mean, all these different phrases that we'd use. And, and they never, you know, if you go to certain areas, and I remember, you know, being early in my youth ministry area, years, and uh, we, we took a, a, a group of 60, 70 kids on a bus one time and, and some vans. We went down to Dallas, Fort Worth. And what we did was we went from one church to the other. We, I mean, not any just random churches, but churches that were uh, doing extremely effective ministry, but they were all doing it a little differently. And they all had things they were noted for. And God was doing this over here, and God was doing that over there, and God was doing this over here, and God was doing that over there. And it's like it was, it was so mind-opening um, to the, the students about all the things God was doing. Because it was just like, it wasn't like where they just, the little town they had come from, they were seeing all these different things that God was doing that they had never experienced before. And they were all different. And they're like, I ran miles apart between this church and this church, but what God was blessing here was different than what God was stirring over here. And it was just a great experience for them. <clears throat> and, and there are places, there are, and it's not because they're cities. I mean, people get caught up in that kind of stuff sometimes because cities here are just as spiritually as dark as small towns. But I'm gonna tell you how this works. Now, I'm, I don't have time to get in all the, you know, the biblical history of all this, but I'm just going to tell you how this works. That if there's a place that's completely spiritually dark, okay? We, we, well, we talk about this in our church. Level. We talk about being light, like, you know, be light in the darkness. We talk about that, right? And we talk about how if you like one match, right? You got light in the darkness. It's not much light, but it's light, right? And if you keep lighting matches together, right? You get more and more light and you get all that light together before you know it, you got a bonfire, right? We keep talking about those kind of things. Now think about just a, whether it's a small town, whether it's a rural region of America, whether it's a large city, doesn't matter what we're talking about. Let's just say it's completely dark and one person believes God. One person stands up and starts to live and speak light and starts to be light in their darkness. And then others who want to experience that begin to is shine light and they begin to gather and then there's just say there's one church that is light in the darkness there's light and then let's just say there's another pocket where the same thing happens and another pocket where the same thing happens and another pocket where the same thing happens and all of a sudden what you have in a city is lots of places of light now <clears throat> Let's picture this like it's a war, okay? So if the American military 
is going to go into a city. Like the one I went through, like the, you know, what we've done in the Middle East. And they know that city is completely controlled by the enemy. And they just start going building by building, street by street. And what they're trying to do is to remove all the threats of the enemy. They know every step they take could be a bomb or could be a sniper, could be an ambush of some nature. When they get done with that process, they have completely swept that community. The idea would be that the enemy is no longer there and now it's a place of safety. Okay, now just that kind of use that picture. Let's picture big city, small town, doesn't matter. And in a spiritual realm, it's completely dark. The enemy runs it. But light walks in. And then more light walks in. Light and darkness do not coexist. Can't happen. Wherever there is light, the darkness has to flee. Now, what I would say to you is that when I came here 17 years ago and I'm sitting with a bunch of pastors and they're saying to me, you can't grow a church in our county. Everybody in our town either always goes to church or they're never going to go to church. You can't reach people here. When I had a pastor stand up and lean across the table like, because you're a football guy, aren't you? Yeah. He wasn't. So when a non-football guy wants to get in the face of a football guy, it's really kind of funny. But anyway, that's the point. Anyway, he gets up, he leans over the table, puts his knuckles on the table, he leans across this table, looks me right in the eye. He goes, pulls up his right hand, points to my face. He goes, I got a challenge for you. Okay? Because I don't know what he's going to say. I don't, I don't know what he's going to say to me. We were, church ran 90 people. I challenge you to stay here long enough to grow that church. And he was like... I mean, he thought he was really firing me up to grow that church to 120 people. I didn't know what to say. I just said, well, I'm, I'm pretty sure I'll do that. Why was I saying that? All around me, we're even, not just, not the lost world. Forget the lost world for a second. Not, don't, don't worry about the atheists. Don't worry about the cynics. All around me were people who claimed to know Christ, who were speaking death, who were believing in the darkness more than they were in the power of God to bring light. I was talking to a bunch of people who were dry bones themselves. Who hadn't seen the activity of the Spirit of God in forever, if ever. They had no hope. I mean, as you read this passage of Scripture, I'll keep going back to it, but if you read this passage of Scripture, like in verse 11 or where it said, it, it said, they say, we have lost hope. They were saying, we have lost hope. You can't do that here. God doesn't work that way here. This can't happen here. What? So to me, you can say, well, you know, that's just Tim's arrogance. That's just Tim being cocky. That's just Tim thinking, whatever, you know. Or maybe it was the Spirit of God who, and I could go through the whole story, I don't have time for that, but the whole story of how that thing happened and what God spoke and the vision we have and all that kind of stuff and what blah, blah, blah. Because what we are today, by the way, isn't new. This vision started before I even came here. I mean, this is, we're just carrying out the same vision. And when I began to use the phrase in the scripture here, I began to prophesy. Here's what God's going to do. Here's what it's going to look like. I mean, so 17 years ago, I talked about kids like Corey coming to Christ. I, I talked about people like you, many of you who didn't know Jesus ever how long ago before you came to Cross Church. You didn't know Jesus. Some of you had knew Jesus. You went to church someplace, but it was dry and it was empty and there wasn't any life to it. We talked about you. I remember buying chairs for you. 
I remember doing things for you. I remember when some of you were here and we were going to build a new building or, you know, we started that process and, and then we ended up, you know, in this building and all that because of you. People, and, and when I say you, not just those who are sitting here, we did that for folks in Stanton and we did that for folks in Haddock and beyond. And we did that folks from Litchfield and we started doing that folks from, from the, I mean, just, I can start naming all the places we're from right now. For the people who aren't even here yet. For the person who's here for the first time today. Or the person who, they're just recovering from a hangover from last night right now. Or they just don't even believe God exists right now. Or they're living in one of our small towns and they have completely lost hope right now. What we're doing is really going back to speaking what we felt God said. Being light in the darkness. Speaking life, not death. Learning to reflect Jesus, not our culture, not our past, not our circumstances. And so now when you speed it up every how many years, Today, we can sit here and go, yeah, man, there's still a lot of darkness out there. Yes, there is, but nothing compared to what it used to be. There's way more hope than what there used to be. There's way more baptisms and life transformation and things like that taking place in our footprint than there used to be. We baptize more people this Sunday than this church baptized in the previous two and a half years before I showed up. What? And remember, nobody was surprised by that today, right? Oh, there's some baptisms. All right, awesome. Three of them, hey, that's really cool. That's awesome. Right? Corey himself led more people to Christ in one meeting than we had led to Christ in the first in the two and a half years before I got here. All by himself. But that doesn't happen without others creating light. Without others walking in the darkness and the dry, and using this like a spiritually dry place and bringing water with them. So can you grow, let's just say, let's kind of shift analogies for a second. Can you grow a, a garden in the desert? Well, yes, you can if you bring enough water to it. You know what I'm saying? Right? If you go into a, a spiritually dry place, can the work of God flourish and grow? Yes, if you bring enough water to it. If you take the spiritually dryness and put enough of the Spirit of God into it, yes, it's no longer spiritually dry then. Number two in the outline. <clears throat> we choose what we believe. We choose what we believe. So in the passage... He begins in verse three, you know, he, okay, here's the reality. They're seeing a valley of dry bones, okay? Verse three is, he says, God says, to, he's equal. Can these bones live? Well, the obvious answer is no. <clears throat> Ezekiel knew he was being set up, so he says, uh, hey, you're the only one who knows. And really, here's the point, and it's, and it's a great statement because it's important, and I'll, I'll say this in the next point too. But, it's not that they can live. It's that whatever God says can happen. It's that what we prophesy, what we speak, what we want to see happen is because it, it has to be in agreement with what God wants to accomplish. And so what Ezekiel's really saying is, you know, God, you're the only one who knows if you want those bones to live. Because no, those bones can't live at the natural level. But if you speak to those bones and you want them to live, they're going to live. That's what he's, that's what he's saying. <clears throat> Every one of us has what I call a declaration of faith. Everyone. Even people who don't have faith, they still have a declaration of their faith or their lack thereof. I'll talk about that more maybe in the next series a little bit because it kind of matches, but here's what I need you to understand. Your statement of faith, your declaration of what you believe either undermines you or strengthens you. That's it. Um, 
I don't want you to turn your Bibles to it, but there's a story in Matthew, excuse me, Matthew chapter 8. And the story is Jesus doing things Jesus does. He's speaking and doing stuff, right? Hang out with people. And a satyrian, one of the Roman leaders of the Roman guard, he comes to Jesus and he's like, you know, my, my person's sick. I need you to come help him out, blah, 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 blah. And Jesus said, I'll be there in a minute. He's like, no. He says, I have, I'm a leader of people. I have men underneath me. I tell them to go and I tell them to come. They do what I tell them to do. And he said, he was, what he says, I'm a man of authority and I recognize your, Jesus' authority. And if you just speak it, my servant will be healed. And Jesus' response was, I mean, I, 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 he probably was gasped because he said, in all of Israel, I have never seen such faith. And then he says this, go and it'll be done just as you believed. Now, let me ask you a question. How many times, if you're looking around your life right now, if you're working around our community, if you're looking around churches, how many times could we say, it is being done right now just like you believed? Well, I didn't think that was going to happen. I wonder why it didn't happen. I didn't think anything would ever change. I wonder why. They'll never get, this will never be. Is it possible that, let's just go back to when I came here, I talked about those pastors saying you can't grow a church in Carlinville and blah, 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 blah. Is it possible that all that was happening was they were receiving what they believed? I'm not being weird. I'm, 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 I'm trying to what the Bible says here. Is it possible that because of their lack of faith, that they were, their declaration of faith was what I'd call a lack of faith. Their declaration of faith was, this can't happen. You can't reach people. Lives aren't being transformed. People don't get saved anymore. You can't grow churches in our, where we live at. It, it, well, all those were declarations of faith. Declarations of what they believed. So then Tim comes to town. Did I bring something special with me? I preached a better message. I mean, what happened? What changed? Sang different songs? What happened? Is it possible that the only thing we're talking about had nothing to do with the person, it had everything to do with a simple what you believe, a simple declaration of faith in God rather than a declaration of the lack of faith in God? Is it possible that all we're talking about, is it, 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 this, is, this is, you have to think about this for a while because it gets your head around this. Is it possible that the only reason that some of you went from death into life, that some of you went from eternities in hell to separate, for, separate from God to a place with God in heaven, your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life and a place for all of eternity with him because somebody decided to believe God, that God can speak to dry bones, that God can go in desolate places who are spiritually dry and he can speak life and he can speak hope and he can speak forgiveness and he can speak. And all of a sudden, because someone believed, then God began to do. Nothing special. See, I believe that God is prepared on any given day of your life to do far more than most of us are willing to accept. That most of us, I mean, I, 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 go, I deal with people all the time. I deal with pastors all the time. I deal with individual churches a lot. <clears throat> and the first thing I have to get them past is, what do you believe is gonna happen? Because as long as they believe it can't work, as long as they believe they can't grow, as long as they believe they can't reach anybody, then they're exactly right. I can't make you believe. I can't make another church, I'm talking about another church I'm working with, I can't make them believe and have the faith that I have. That, it doesn't work that way. So Max's question again. See, all of us choose what we believe. We choose what we believe about our marriages, we choose what we believe about our families. We choose what we believe about our communities or our churches or all those kind of phrases. We choose what we believe. And I always love the person who says, well, I'm a realist. 
I get you, I know what you mean, so am I. Being a realist doesn't mean that you don't walk by faith. There's a difference in walking by um, optimism and walking by something God speaks. I'm a realist. And there's times God doesn't speak faith in me about something. That's what realism is. But on the other hand, when God speaks faith, it has just become real. You just have to walk by it. I am convinced that whether it's church level or individual level or anything in between, I am convinced at the community level, whatever, that many times what we experience is what we believe we're going to experience. The person who says, well, I just can't be forgiven for that will never experience what I call forgiveness. They would have received it, but they'll never experience it. They'll never know what it's like. The person who says, I'll never get out of this, they'll never make it out. On the other hand, the person who says, this can be saved or this can be different or this can be transformed, they'll get to experience that. Number three in the outline, um, the power, there is power in, de- in declaring in agreement with God. There's power in declaring <laughs> in agreement with God. All right. Um, I've been talking about this a little bit. I don't have time to get too far into this, but when you hear me say things, understand um, because you think something doesn't make it right. Because your emotions make you feel something doesn't make it right. I'm not talking about anything you make up. I mean, I don't think that, you know, I, you can just walk in and say, hey, this is going to happen, and bam, it happens. That's not how it works, okay? What I believe is, is that God always has a plan. I believe that if you are a child of God and his spirit indwells you, that God has a plan, a purpose for your life. Pause that. I also believe that if you don't believe God exists, If you're far, far, far from God, you have no clue about him. His spirit does not live in you. I still believe he has a plan for you. I still believe he's going to draw you to himself. I still believe you're his child. There's not a person born that wasn't born with the blessing and the power of God. I mean, he, he, I mean, the person doesn't believe God exists. He gave you a spiritual gift at birth. You, you have a spiritual gift, a motivational gift that one is yours. You got your whole life. His spirit don't live inside of you. He hasn't transformed you and empowered you and changed you and all that kind of stuff. But God, I believe that all the people around us, that God wants to draw people to himself. What I believe is that the church is silent, that the church is quiet, that the church is speaking all kinds of things, but they're not speaking hope and they're not speaking life. The church looks like so much else in the community. I believe that individual people call themselves Christians. They're not living in power by the spirit of God. They're just living life. Just doing things. And the lost person who lives in this house and the saved person who lives in this house, they look just alike. They act just alike. Nothing is different in them. Well, let me just tell you something. To the lost world, you're trying to be normal. You're trying to fit in. You're trying to be cool. Let me tell you you something. To the lost world, you look like there's nothing about your life they want. To the person who's, I don't say even cynical, is I want to know if it's real or not. How do I know if it works? How do I know? You want to see if it works. You're looking for someone. You know the old poison song, give me something real to believe, right? Give me something to believe in. I'm saying it in my head right now. Anyway. <laughs> right? I mean, it's like that. I mean, how many of you know the song you're singing it with me right now, right? If, if I could sing, if I, had, if I could sing, I would be so dangerous. I'm just telling you, I'd tear up. Like, anyway, <laughs> I'm breaking the song all the time. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. So just get your head around that. How many people around us, maybe, maybe in this room right now, just because you're sitting here doesn't mean you buy in, right? What you're saying is, I mean, I'm, I'm a good person. I generally believe all the right things. Man, but before I really buy in, I want to know it's real. There's so much fake and there's so much flakiness. There's so much surface level emotional garbage. 
I don't want to be hurt. I don't want to be burned. I don't want to be let down. I don't want to be disappointed. I, I just, I need to know what's real. Now, your neighbor may never say that sentence to you, but maybe that's exactly how they're thinking. The person you work with may never say those sentences to you, but that may be exactly how they're thinking. That student who comes through your class at school, that, that person that you deal with on the given, you know, wherever it is, they may never say those sentences to you, but that may be exactly what they're thinking. I need it. I just want to know if it's real or not. And what happens is, is there are people who just, I mean, and I'm saying this, this is all over the place. They just go to church. I'm, I, can, I, can I be honest? I, I don't want you to make that I'm a horrible person. I mean, I'm not, a, I'm not really that good, but I don't want you to think I'm horrible. I'm not a good enough person to just go to church. I'm not. If I went to church and it was dead, why would I go there? If I went to church, and I, I don't need, okay, I used to get irritated in college. I went to a Christian college. I surrendered the ministry after, well, anyway, at that point. I went to a Christian college. <laughs> and there were people that didn't go to church at my Christian college. Okay? They, just went, they, they probably were Christians, probably raised in church, but they slept in. You know, we was up late last night, just slept in. Okay, so lunch is served at lunchtime, which is after church. And I used to get so frustrated with people who didn't go to church, but they would come to lunch in their church clothes. Okay, at Cross Church, you're sitting in your church clothes that look like your regular everyday clothes, right? But back in the olden days, people had dress clothes. <laughs> and you only wore dress clothes at church. So they'd get up in the morning, sleep till noon, get up, get their hair all done, get all dolled up, put on their dress clothes, suits and ties and dresses to come to eat lunch. What a bunch of fakes. Man, that frustrated me. If you didn't go to church, I don't care. You're not going to hell over it, but don't come faking it. Right? Which is worse, not going to church or faking it. Right? You know what I'm saying? Okay, the point is, is that they, there are people who they just, I, I have to go to church. That's what we do. I, I know that everyone in this room right now, I know everyone in Staunton campus, everyone in Head of campus, I know that everyone at church today is not here because you have a right heart and a right mind. Sometimes you're just here going through the motions. Sometimes you're just here going through what you're going through. I need you to understand there's way more than that. See, God didn't want you just to sit there and receive. God wants the, you to hear from him, know his purpose and his plan for you, and be able to declare that in faith, in agreement with what he's saying about your life, about your church, about your community. What if we were the ones who, not, not just Tim on the stage, or not just a handful of people, what if we were the ones not making up stuff to say, but seeing enough time with a living God that we knew, just like what he said to Ezekiel here, hey, do you believe that can happen? I don't know. Well, let me tell you. Yes, it can happen. Prophesy to it. Speak to the hopelessness about hope. Speak to the darkness about light. Speak to those who need transformation about transformation. Speak to this about that. What if we started speaking life and speaking hope over the place we lived? What if we all Stop going through the motions of church. And wherever we are on the spectrum, far from God, really close to Jesus. And we just took next steps. Like, let's talk about me for a second again. I was far from God. I would call, I was a Christian. Knowing Jesus is your savior doesn't mean you're close to Jesus. And there was a long distance between me and where I'm at. And I didn't know I, what I believed a lot, about a lot of things. I mean, can God really do that? Can God really change that? Do miracles still happen? 
Can you really grow a church in the middle of a dry and thirsty place? Or whatever topic is. I mean, I mean, I grew up in an area where they were saying that you can't reach people anymore. People don't come to Jesus anymore. All that other kind of stuff. We're in an environment where every year more and more churches are closing their doors. I mean, that's the world we live in, right? Well, you know where I got from where, I'm at, where I was to where I'm at? You know how I did that? Crazy process. I just took one more step. Let's just see. Let's see if that works. Well, the Bible says it works. I feel God stirring my heart in that area. Okay? I'm just going to take a step and see what happens. Okay, that worked. Wow, that worked too. The point is, is that when you see me up here running fast, let's say, running as fast as I can into Jesus, it's because I spent years taking, I'll call them hesitant steps. Because I needed to know that what I experienced was real. I needed to know the Bible was true. I needed to know that it was all the things it said about itself. I need to know that the whole thing about Jesus and the resurrection was real. I mean, I'm not going to tell you it's real if I don't think it is, right? I had to work through all those processes. I had to start from the very beginning, work through why do I believe what I believe? Why do I think what I think? Why am I experiencing what I'm experiencing? I had to work through all those processes. So when you see yourself way back here someplace, let's say, yeah, I believe in God. You know, I'm good with that. And I think I'm saved and all that, but I'm not serving some of this other stuff. Seems weird. I watched some stuff on the, you know, Discovery Channel that said it wasn't true, whatever. Okay, God has no problem evidencing himself, convincing you about himself. But you have to be in this proximity for that to happen. Seek him, ask him, give him a chance. Like, God, this is really true. Evidence this in me. God, this is really true. I'm gonna take a step on this thing. In this area, show this in me. Begin to prophesy in your own, before you can be like me and prophesy out there, like, I believe in, everything that you hear me say, I'm 100% bought into. I buy in. I'm all in. Well, why is that? I wasn't all in back here someplace. I just took next steps. I'm like, God, I need you to do this so I know. God loves you. He wants to, clear, to clearly evidence himself to you. See what some people call it's lack of faith? Hmm. Sometimes a lack of faith is just a lack of experience. You know what I'm saying? Like, for the senior in high school who's taking calculus, right? And they're doing all kinds of crazy math problems that most of us don't understand, right? And then there's the third grader. And they're just trying to figure out, you know, multiplication, division, and fractions and stuff. At the third grade level, does it mean that the third grader isn't as smart as the senior in high school? Or does it mean they just are missing a whole bunch of years of experience in education? You see what I'm saying? So I can be back here. I'm at a third grade level. I got faith for a third grader. I got faith for a person who's been following God for three weeks or for three months or for three years or for whatever. I got faith right here. This is not a lack of faith because I'm not down there someplace. It just means this is where I'm at in the journey. The question is, am I going to keep walking that way? That's the question. Then I want to go into, walk this way. Sorry about that. Okay. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> the question is, I'm going to walk this way. And here's what's happened a lot of times. A lot of times many of us, we got saved. And I'm going to talk about this in the next, another point in just a second. Many of us got saved somewhere and we just stopped. We thought, get baptized, get saved, go to church. That's it. Our faith has never grown. So we're like, the, we're like the 18 year old who's still in third grade. Somewhere we just decide that's wrong, right? But there are many, many, many people who've been Christians for a really long time or at least have grown to church an awful lot. But their faith is not where it ought to be at. Because their declarations have been more about their absence of faith than their faith. It's been more about what they didn't believe 
Well, I guess what they did believe. They, they just ended up believing more about the work of the enemy around them than the work of God in and through them. <coughs> Number four in the outline, and this is kind of where I, where I kind of got into this a little bit. Are you settling for half of God's promise to you? Are you selling for half of God's promise to you? In the passage, um, God told Ezekiel to prophesy. He prophesied, and the bones all came together, and the ligaments and the, all that kind of stuff all came together, right? But there was no breath, it said, right? The breath represents the Holy Spirit. Anyway, there's no breath. How many of us, maybe? People go to a good church. Yeah, the Holy Spirit's not really operating the way it's supposed to operate. I'm getting an education but I'm not experiencing transformation. I'm, I'm still in third grade over here. I'm not dumb, I'm not, I don't have a bad heart, but I'm not taking any steps of faith. I, right, I cannot educate you into a mature faith. I cannot educate you into having enough hope. I cannot educate you. You can't go to enough life groups. You can't read enough Bible stories. You can't do enough stuff to educate yourself into the, whatever you want to call that, and maturity as a follower of Christ. Those are steps of obedience. Those are experiences you have to have. The, the only way you, the, you, you say, well I, well, I need everything proven to me before I take a first step. That's not how it works. You got to take steps. You just got to, you, you have to take steps. It's taking the steps. It's the experiences, how God transforms you. It's, it's in the middle of the mission that you become mature. That's that process. If you want to grow, that it happens during the mission, not reading a textbook about how it happens. It's doing it. I mean, and you know this is true in every area of life. It's not just what you read, but it's when you actually start doing the thing you read about. Oh, that's what that means. Oh, that's how that works. Or I found a better way to do it. Or, oh, it works this way. The same way is true in your walk with Christ. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I used a passage of scripture out of John chapter seven. Jesus was talking, and how he said it was that anyone who come to him, they, the river of living water flow from within, talked about the Holy Spirit. And he talked about that whole word thirsty, and we spent some time with that, about um, anyone who is thirsty, come to me and I'll give them a drink, and they'll never thirst again. And one of the things I talked about that morning was about how one of our problems is we're not thirsty, we're not hungry, whatever the word is for God, because we've already been distracted by other things. We're already full of other stuff. You know, that's the problem is that we don't, I mean, we didn't come to church hungry for God today. I mean, that, most of us didn't do that. Well, why not? Because we're just full of other stuff. We've got too many other things going on, too many other distractions. We're, we're putting in too many other things that meet our needs. We don't just need Jesus. Now, I mean, just process for me, because this is, I mean, I mean, I could go this a long time, I don't have time for it, but I just need you to understand, it's like, are you settling for half of the promise God has for you? He doesn't just want to save you, he wants to empower you. He don't want you just to be a better person, be moral and go to church, he wants to transform you into the likeness of his son. He, he wants you to not just attend church and be in a life group and, and give some money and volunteer a few times, he, what he wants you to do is he wants you to speak life. He wants you to be light. He wants you to reflect Jesus. He wants you to be an ongoing example of his grace, of his mercy, of his love. He wants the church you attend to be filled with people just like that, but also filled with people who are far from God, people who are just coming to Jesus, people who just came to Jesus. That the church ought to have a wide range of people attending it. Because that's what the biblical church looks like. That God all around us is drawing people to himself. Not because of the cat on the stage talking, but because of the people who are in the community living. That's how it's supposed to look. That's what it's supposed to look like. Now, if you're back here in third grade, God can tell you, hey, I want you to know calculus up here somewhere. You're so far from that, it makes no sense at all. And then in your mind, it's so overwhelming. Well, I just can't do that. That could never happen. You're right, that can never happen. But if the third grader keeps doing math, and they do math at the fourth grade level, and then math at the fifth grade level, and then math at an eighth grade level, and they get into high school, and they start taking math classes, and I say, you know, instead of shrinking back from math classes, they take more math classes, all of a sudden, they're a junior or a senior taking calculus. Well, how'd that happen? Because they kept taking next steps. 
Are you tracking? Yes? So the person back here, maybe you, you're at third grade as a follower of Christ. And then somewhere down the road over here, you're like, you know, you are the bright light. You are the one speaking hope. You're the one leading people to Christ. You're the best life group pastor this church has ever seen. How do we go from being in third grade to being here? It's just next steps. Just one more step after the next. It's choosing to believe in God, not what you see. It's choosing to believe in God, not what you feel. It's choosing to make declarations of faith that God can do this. God will do this. I believe in this. And then just take next steps. <clears throat> Number five. People are looking for hope. <laughs> now it says in verse 11. And then he said to me, son of man, these bones of people of Israel, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We're cut off. Then God says to Ezekiel, but prophesy to them. Now hear me. The third grader, and let's say it's your child, and your child has an aptitude for math and whatever. And you speak to your third grader, and your third grader's like, I will never understand calculus. Calculus is way beyond my abilities. I have no idea about calculus. That looks so hard. And as a parent, you'd say, no, no, hey, don't worry about calculus yet. You're not there. By the time you get there, you'll get it. You know what you'd say to them? Down here, I got no hope. People before Christ, people who know Christ. Many times our declaration of faith is, I have no hope. God can't forgive me. God can't use me. God can't restore me. God can't heal me. God can't set me free. Go to the community level. My community will never change. It's always going to be this way. God doesn't care about this, and that will never go away. The heroin problem is always going to be the heroin problem. Whatever we're going to talk about, it's always going to be the way it is. Or, you know what? Here's what God says. We're not there yet. Take one more step. And here's what God says. Because God's not going to speak it me, to me or you if we're in third grade at the calculus level. Because we're third graders. He's going to talk to us because we're third graders. And you know what? When we're in sixth grade, he ain't talking about calculus. He's talking about sixth grade. He's given me something I can do something with. He's asked me to take a next step that I can handle. He's asked me to believe in him in a way that I can do it. So like last Sunday or whenever it was, I was talking about that we've never been in a place like this before where God can do things in us. What I was saying is when we were back, you know, years ago and we had, didn't have space, we didn't have that, we didn't have this other thing, whatever it was we didn't have, we were back here. God never asked us to do whatever, multi-campuses when we couldn't do multi-campuses. God never asked us to baptize every week. We couldn't baptize every week. I mean, pick the topic, whatever you want to pick. God didn't ask us to do something back here that we couldn't do. And so if this is where we are today, God's not asked us to do something that we can do in 20 years from now. He's asked us to do what we can do today. So we talk about, can we have a thousand people at Easter? I know the answer sounds like the answer is no. Unless God wants that to happen and we choose to agree with him. God will never ask us to do something we can't do. We're not the third grade anymore. We may not be ready for calculus, but we're not third grade. So what's the next step? See, all around us. I mean, you think people living in Medora right now has got hope? You think people living in there, certainly in little towns around us. Certainly even in Carlinville. How many people live in Carlinville and they completely lost hope? Live in Staunton, they've completely lost hope. About everything, not just Jesus. My little town's going to dry up. How many people live in Litchfield and lost hope? How many people live in Hillsborough and lost hope? How many people live in Farmersville or Pawnee or Waverly or Wharton or Bunker Hill or Pysaw and they've lost hope? How many people don't believe? They may even go to church, but they don't believe in a God who does the kind of things that we believe God does just because they've never experienced it. 
See, here's how I think about it. And this is maybe just me. Just like he said to Ezekiel. They say, you can't grow a church there. They say, nobody gets saved anymore. They say, lives don't get transformed anymore. They say, and I got a long list of they says. The day we stop caring about what they say, and we start caring about what Jesus says is the day we start making declarations that matter. Declarations that change lives. Declarations of hope. My last point, very quickly, because I've been talking about it already. God wants to demonstrate his power so people know who he is. Throughout that passage, and if I had time, I could go back and keep reading those to you, but throughout that passage, God would say something, and then he would say, then they will know that I am God. Then they will know that I am the Lord. If I go back to our, the passage, our vision comes out of our first Kings chapter 18. It's after the whole Elijah and prophets of Baal and the fire of God fall thing. The whole point was, the, the prayer was that then they will know that you're Lord and that you're turning their hearts back towards you. That's the whole point. Why do we want to keep getting, reaching more people? Why do we want to have more campuses? Why do we want to keep doing, seeing God do things that people think can't happen or whatever you want to name? Why does that matter? I mean, why? It, it's not about the thing. Why then? So that people will know that he is God and that he is turning their hearts back toward him. That's why. Why do we see one more life transformed? Why? It's not about the number. It's about the individual story. It's about the people around there who can look at that and go, man, if God can change them, then maybe he can change me. It's, it's about the person who looks and goes, they, they see something. It's not the message they heard from me. It's the thing they saw in you. And they look at that thing they saw in you and they go, and they don't understand what it is at the time, but it's God turning the, their heart back toward him. Why should you not allow yourself to stay in third grade, spiritually speaking, and continue taking next steps toward Jesus? Why? Because there are people watching you. And when you're trying to blend in with the crowd, when you're trying to look like the lost world, you're not being a good example of Jesus. You're not being light in the darkness. When I don't, I'm just afraid of being rejected. I know, I know. I get you. You know what I'm afraid of? People going to hell. I'm afraid of people living in my footprint that they're living without hope. I'm afraid of these little towns that I drive through that don't have Jesus, that have no light in their darkness. That even the light they do have is a form of darkness. It's just shady. It's, it's hopeless. It's faithless. That it's filled with what can't happen rather than what God's going to do. If I've done nothing in 17 years. Matter of fact, next Sunday will be my 17th anniversary. <clears throat> if I've done nothing in 17 years. I hope that you have had enough evidence that God is exactly who he said he is and he can do things that everyone says can't happen for his glory. And so people know that he really is Lord. Why declare hope? Why speak life? I mean, it's so much easier to speak death Why be light? It's so much easier not to stand out in the darkness. Why reflect Jesus? It's so much easier just to cover up, live in your own little world. So why? Because we are surrounded by dry bones. Spiritually dead people, some of which actually attend church every Sunday. 
And I believe that God wants us to prophesy over them. To speak life. To speak hope. To speak restoration. No different than I believed it years ago before some of you came. I don't care how big our church gets. I don't care how many campuses this church has. I don't care how cool our technology ever becomes. That almost means nothing to me. At the end of the day, what matters to me are individual names and individual stories. Not just the ones who are done, but the ones who are in process. The ones that may not be pre-Jesus yet, but they're in third grade still. The ones that may not be in third grade, but they've not matured yet, they're still growing, they're, they're sophomores in high school. But also, the ones that are so far from God that he's not even on their radar screen yet. See, I believe in a God who makes dry bones live. Whose spirit makes them come alive. And I believe he can do that for entire communities, not just a church, not just people who attend that church. But I believe as we continue to brighten our shine in the darkness, we open the door for other churches and other followers of Christ. It makes it easier for their light to shine. That we're going building by building through the place that God planted us and we're removing the darkness with light. That every time we can step into one more home, or to sit down one more street and we bring lightness on that street. That we bring, we bring Jesus wherever we go. That all, it's just the, the, the darkness is forcing to flee. I believe in a God who doesn't want just to have a big church in the middle of a location. He wants to have a church that is a part of seeing lives transformed for his glory and his purposes alone. And he's not going to do that here. He's going to do it there and there and there and there and there. And the darkness is going to flee. Now, as crazy as I sound, I I don't have time, I gotta get off the stage, but I can keep talking about what we're trying to do or what we think God's wanting to do in us and all kind of stuff. The craziest as that sounds today, it doesn't sound any crazier today than it did when I talked about where we are today back then. That's why we all share hope. That's why we all declare it into the darkness. That's why we ought to speak it over our families, over our church, over the streets we drive through on the way to work, over the neighbors, over the people who are far from him. It's real. Let's pray together. Hey, Father, you... um, You have evidenced yourself countless times. If I, if I was to go back and say, okay, 17 years ago, I didn't know you. If I just walked this journey with you for 17 years, you have clearly evidenced yourself over and over and over and over and over again. God, um, we're not asking you to make us big. We don't care about that. But God, we're asking you to continue to speak in us so we can declare into the darkness around us. 
Well, God, we're asking you to continue to speak in us so we can declare to the hopelessness around us that we can declare to the brokenness around us, that we can declare whether it be the people or just into the heavenlies, that God, that you're gonna do what you're gonna do and that you're gonna bring hope, that you're gonna bring peace, that you're gonna transform lives, that you're gonna keep bringing people from death into life, that you're gonna keep bringing people out of the darkness into light, that God, you're gonna continue drawing people to yourself for your glory. God, in another 10 years, another 20 years, we can look back and we say, man, look at all that God's done. Look at the thousands of people who have given their life to Jesus. God, we'll forget about this message by then. But those days all begin with people who are willing to declare, to speak hope in their present. God, help us be those people. So just now I pray. Amen. Let's